Hello, uh, my name is Lynn Murray. I um, have a degree in uh, paleontology from the University of Texas. And I am currently and have been for about a decade the uh, district paleontologist at Antebrago Desert State Park in Colorado Desert District of the California State Parks. And today I'm going to talk about the, the paleontology of Antebrago Desert State Park. And in fact, we've got a, a book that was published in 2006 that has uh, much of the uh, imagery that I'll be showing you. And uh, those, are, those are available uh, uh, if you would like copy. Um, today's uh, discussion will, will start out with the geology that is the background of the, of the park. And, uh, which allows us to find the fossils here. And um, uh, I'll begin uh, talking about the uh, age of the, of the fossils go, uh, or, the, or the entire system goes back to at least 200 million years. However, the, the majority of the fossils that we find here are no more than about eight, eight to 10 million years old, down to uh, about 10,000 years old. And uh, the, the, the various reasons for that have to do with the, the history of the geology. And um, uh, I'll have, have a couple of images here to show you in a second. Um, start with uh, the very top. Yeah, that one. yeah, let's do this. And um, give you a little background on the, on the uh, also the, the history of the paleontology program and uh, give you a, uh, an idea of what kind of fossils that we have found here and, and what they mean to us. Um, so the, the park was first visited over 165 years ago and, and recognized that it had fossils in it and they didn't, uh, and they were somewhat unusual from those fossils that were being found on the uh, on the coast, um, okay. and uh, uh, the park itself has been uh, providing permits to to do research for over sixty five years, specifically for for hunting for and, and uh, analyzing the fossil uh, fossils that are found here. Uh, we have a 45 years of volunteering for specifically for paleontology. And uh, the park itself has actually managed the, the fossils directly for only about 25 years. The majority of the uh, time before that was uh, fossils were collected and taken to other institutions such as Los Angeles County Museum. And um, we have had a, 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 a continuous society of paleontology volunteers for a, a over 25 years, averaging 40 members per season. And uh, they produce about nine to 10,000 hours per year of volunteer services. And if you multiply that by what we would normally pay somebody like that, it's a lot of, uh, of, of time and, and money that they're volunteering to us. Yeah. Um, now to orient you as to where we are, the, the red outline is the, the, uh, the park boundaries. And you can see we're right smack in the middle of southern, southern, southern California, right next to the Salton Sea. And uh, it constitutes so 650,000 acres, which is about the largest uh, state park in uh, the continental United States. Uh, and the yellow parts that you see are the fossiliferous areas. These are sedimentary beds. The other beds uh, that are not 
fossil uppers are the, the mountains, which are metamorphics and granites. Uh, and we don't typically find uh, fossils in either of those. And then the flat smooth areas are, are lands that are um, not uh, producing fossils because they're, they're very recent and we would have to dig very deep to find the fossils. So um, the geology is based on a whole bunch of, of um, events that have occurred over, as I said, over the last 250 million years. And uh, I put together this kind of weird looking uh, chart, uh, but it's broken down showing uh, events that are continental in, in uh, scope or, or regional or even glo global, such as climates. Uh, and the oldest you can see is, uh, is a subduction that has to do with tectonics, uh, which uh, many of you are familiar with, but uh, uh, something called the Farallon Plate. Uh, we also have uh, the uplift of the Colorado Plateau. And most of these things you may have never heard of, but you can certainly look, up, look them up on Wikipedia or, or some other uh, source and get some instant information about them. Uh, one of the main things is San Andreas Fault system was activated about 8 million years ago. Another is the uh, uh, down cutting of the Grand Canyon and the establishment of the Colorado River Delta. And that's about four to five million years ago. Uh, Panama land bridge and cut off of the seaway between the Caribbean and the Pacific are very important to uh, the paleontology here. And the uh, beginning of the ice age is about 2.7 million years ago. And then finally, the uplift of the peninsular mountain ranges and activation of uh, local San Jacinto and Elsinore fault systems, which uh, uh, brought most of these fossils uh, up to the surface. Now I'm going to run through a very quick animation that I put together based on uh, scientific studies of the last 25 or 30 years. And this shows the Baja California all the way up to San Gregorio Pass. It's all moving up to the Northwest with respect to North America. So let's see what happens. Eight million, six million years ago, you can see Baja is pulling away from the continent and the whole thing is sliding up along the San Andreas Fault. And um, we move a little faster, you can see that the, the Colorado River is in place in the yellow delta. And uh, if we go, go back, uh, let me, let me uh, just go back a little bit. And if you'll look at the, the star, uh, this, is, this represents Anzabrego Desert State Park. So we're actually start out in the uh, in the middle of the sea, and then we're, we're moving because Baja is moving to the northwest. We're moving into the delta and into uh, what's called subaerial or, or terrestrial land, landscape. And, um, and then finally, we end up with the Salton Sea uh, and encumbered behind the delta uh, to the north. And uh, then this is what it looks like uh, today. So, um, and then I'm going to revisit these, not all of them, but a couple of them just to emphasize uh, what actually happened. And then this is a, a strat, what's called a stratigraphic sequence. Uh, it's a cross section down through the deepest part of this uh, stack of sediments that's been laid down over the last 8 million years. And uh, if you can you read this up close, you'll see that the uh, represents uh, different time periods as you go from bottom to top up to 5 million years uh, ago to, to zero, uh, uh, the present. And um, the different kinds of sediments, some are terrestrial, uh, alluvium, and then, you, you're, uh, then it's replaced with uh, 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 deep marine uh, muds, and then slowly replaced by uh, deltaic sands, and then later uh, sands and, and gravels coming off of local mountains. And then, uh, uh, so if we go back to 8 million years, here's where our star is right in the continental uh, part of Mexico. And here's what the uh, sediments are looking like. They're coming off the mountains directly. They're big, uh, in some cases, car-sized rocks that are very uh, uh, roughly mixed. And we don't see many fossils there. And then, as the uh, opening of the, of the 
the delta uh, creates the beginning of what's called the Imperial Sea or the Gulf of California. Uh, we can see that our star is right in the middle of that. So we, we see some, uh, uh, that's where we begin to see marine invertebrates. Uh, now here's a, a map of the Colorado River drainage, which shows where all of the green area, all of those sediments are being deposited into, uh, so all of the sediments from here are being deposited down into, yeah, there we go. Yeah, down into uh, right at Yuma, right into the Gulf of California. This includes the Grand Canyon, which is right here. And uh, so all the sediments from the Grand Canyon have basically ended up in, uh, in the Antiparago Desert State Park. And then uh, beginning about 5 million years ago is when the, do I still have the, mm -hmm. okay. Uh, is when we have the opening of, of the, yeah, opening of the Delta area here, right next to Yuma. And uh, yeah, let's go back a little further. Um, yeah. And here's what it might look like with uh, uh, walruses. Uh, you wouldn't expect to see walruses way up this far uh, away from the, the pole. Um, yet uh, they were here and we've got several representatives of them, yeah. And then at about 4 million years ago, uh, Panama, or I'm sorry, uh, South America and North America came together through uh, plate tectonics and uh, two things happened. Uh, one is that the, there's a land bridge formed at Panama, allowing North and South American uh, animals to uh, transfer across. And the other thing is that the, the waters of the Caribbean coming from the east were no longer, were blocked from bringing warm water into the, the Eastern Pacific, which uh, changed types of uh, marine invertebrates we're seeing along the coast. And then here's a couple of the uh, South American uh, visitors that uh, we have found in the park. This is a, uh, what's called a terror bird. And the fossils on the right, which is the tip of the beak, which is the brown area in the, in the image. And also we have uh, giant ground sloths. And uh, uh, these were uh, known uh, throughout many of the southern state or southwest of uh, Arizona and, and California and Nevada today from in the fossil record. Uh, also at the same time, we had our local critters uh, living down. This is a representation of what it might look like down on the Colorado River Delta uh, three and a half million years ago with this small proboscidean called a gomphotheer. And we'll, we'll see this guy again uh, right soon because uh, it's a footprint of the, of the gomphotheer. And, uh, oops, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can see the bottom of the foot and then the, he stepped into some mud. And then up above it, you'll see uh, these are, uh, tracks of something called a wolf coyote, which is a little bit bigger than a, than a coyote. And then right next to it are some cat footprints, which is a bobcat-like animal. Um, so, and then at 2.7 million years ago was the beginning of the ice ages. And so uh, by that time, our, our fossils, uh, fossil uh, sediments were being deposited uh, from uh, on land rather than on the, under underwater, so all of our majority of our uh, vertebrate fossils are uh, uh, land animals. So we see giant tortoises and saber-toothed cats and peccaries, similar to modern javelinas, but uh, uh, considerably larger. Then, at uh, about two million years ago, the uh, mountain ranges around us began to raise further, and uh, the San Jacinto and Elsinore faults began shifting the upper crust and uh, providing, oh, we didn't have our, okay. Uh, providing the fossils for us to, to actually see. Now here's what the, uh, the lake area down on what we call Lake Kauia, or today it's the Salton Sea is a much reduced uh, footprint, but we had um, tapers and bobcats and uh, looks like Canada geese and flamingos 
down near the lake. And this is the valleys just above the lake. And we have horses and camels and mammoths and, uh, and our, our wolves. And then down in the river uh, valleys, we have otters and bears and, and woodpeckers and turkeys. And uh, um, so that's, that's kind of the story of the, of the of paleontology. And I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the program we have here, which is the, the volunteers who come and work with us. And in fact, they do the majority of the physical work we do as staff. Um, I'm kind of uh, have to deal with uh, reports and planning and, and, and stuff like that. And the, uh, the people who actually go walk the ground and look for fossils, bring them in and, and prepare them and then catalog them. A lot of that work is done by our volunteers. And so the question is who do who does this? And here's a list of, of, of uh, these are actual people who, who are working here now. Uh, this is their background uh, or some people we've had in the recent past. So these are all um, uh, the, the skill set that, uh, that our, our volunteers bring with them and their experience. And it's all useful in different ways, yeah. So here's what the, the result of those geological changes over the last 8 million years look like after these sediments have been lifted up because of the Elsinore and San Jacinto faults. And these have been raised up uh, several hundred feet and tilted. So the different colors you see and bands are actually different layers. And those can be uh, differentiated from each other. In some cases, not many, but in some cases we can actually apply uh, real dates to, to uh, some of that uh, geology. Uh, and here we go out in the field with, uh, with the uh, uh, volunteers. So it's a, uh, uh, we can drive up part of the way, but most of it's walking uh, once we get out into the field and uh, uh, everyone goes and we, we uh, they have been trained over a, a year long training program and uh, know their, their job once they get out there, finding the fossils, recording them and, and collecting them. So, uh, yeah. So the next part we're gonna do is uh, showing some of the uh, aspects to the, to the program. Uh, we're currently in the, what's called the preparation laboratory. And the overall building that we're in is called the Stout Research Center and part of, as part of the Colorado Desert District. And uh, we also have biology and other uh, aspects to it. So uh, we're gonna show you the, what the room looks like. Uh, and in effect, this is typical of many, many paleontology laboratories. It looks a little junky and a little cluttered, uh, but uh, that's because there's a lot of activity happening. And, uh, or, uh, but we do have some high-end technology working with us. And so we use uh, various uh, microscopes, hand drills, and, and, uh, and then um, methodologies and materials uh, to create uh, uh, jackets and, and such. The first thing that happens once we find a fossil is it's brought in and then uh, uh, it's prepared, which means we, uh, we have, have it captured in a jacket in the field of plaster and burlap. We bring it in, cut it open, and then uh, clean it off. This happened to be a mammoth skull that was uh, discovered several years ago. And uh, it takes a long time to, to clean some of these, uh, and prepare some of these very large uh, specimens, especially when we had maybe a limited crew working on them. Uh, in any case, the uh, uh, next step after uh, cleaning it and identifying it is then uh, making a more permanent uh, home for it. In those cases, you might want to turn over here and you can see uh, this is a part of that same mammoth. This is, uh, I believe it's part of the hip bone. And we put it into a, uh, what's called a cradle, made it also plaster, but a different uh, material. And then um, uh, can, can you see that one right here? This is actually part of a tusk and uh, uh, tibia. 
of uh, this is from this mammoth. It's from a different critter, but this is what's called a clamshell cradle. So we were able to make this into two two sections where we can flip the whole thing over, and it protects it. And so this is one of the, this is a process that's been developed in all museums over the last 40 years or so. And I think we're close to up to snuff with, with most of them. Um, I think as far as uh, other stuff in here, we could probably go to the next, go next, head next door. Uh, so if you follow me, uh, don't trip over anything. <laughs> Once we have uh, brought, found, a, found a fossil, brought it into the preparation laboratory and then prepared it, then we ship it over next door into our collection facility. Uh, collection call. And we have about 180 of these metal cabinets. These are standard geology specimen cabinets. And uh, this is where all of the fossils are uh, stored. Uh, there's actually another step or two before they get put into the cabinets. And that is once they've been prepared, they're brought over here and we identify what element they are, which means if you have a bone, you figure out if it's a arm bone, a leg bone, a toe bone, et cetera. And then you figure out who it belongs to. Is it, is it a uh, taper? Is it a, a mammoth? Is it a shrew? And, uh, and then once we get that done, then we write all that stuff down and put it into a database and that's our catalog. And, uh, and with that, we can uh, find where those specimens are. We, we can put them away in our cabinet. Now this is a specialty cabinet, cabinet where we use for, for show and tell because we can put a whole bunch of things together in one spot. And so this is showing a little higher. Yeah, thanks. Um, these are some of our marine uh, critters that, uh, so these are mostly about six to four million years old. An example of a nice uh, snail. And this is actually the internal structure, not the, the shell itself. Uh, and here's another different kind of snail called Turtella. And then uh, we have several different types of clams. And I don't know if you can see that. There we go. That's good. Uh, it's got all the ribbing uh, going uh, radially outward. Uh, so this is very similar to if you're familiar with the shell oil sign. I don't want to, uh, uh, but that's the one that most people know. Um, and then uh, these are some uh, uh, oysters. We've got several different kinds of oysters here. Oh, this is one of my favorites. This is a, uh, this is a sort of an oblong oyster, but you can see uh, these are growth rings. Uh, let me see if I can get a yeah, texture up there. These are actually growth bands. So the, the things start out about this big and then it's grown through the years and it adds a layer uh, periodically to get to the large size. We have some of my favorites, uh, a lot of people, favorites of sand dollars and a very close relative called a sea biscuit. And the difference is in you know, visually, it's this is very flat and this has quite a thickness to it, like a big cookie. And uh, let's see, oh, uh, yeah, I have corals in there. Let's see, go into the vertebrate part of the collection and we get, uh, this is a humerus bone and this is, you can compare it to mine. It's it's the upper upper arm. So this guy's might go to your your left and the other way. No, no, rotate that way. There you go. Yeah, yeah. This is the humerus, <laughs> not this one, not this one. Uh, just to show you that that guy is pretty substantial. That's a bear, and it's called uh, short-faced bear, which is the largest. Uh, predator, uh, predatory mammal uh, in North America, uh, I think ever as far as mammals go. And then uh, this is actually a limb bone of a camel. Uh, just to give you a 
names of what we have here uh, rather than you probably won't of course recognize anything. This is a snake. I don't know if you can see any of the, uh, it's all coiled up and uh, it's actually could be a little more interesting to see. But uh, let's try the next, next row. Here we go. Here's some fun. Now I told you we had a taper. This right here is a juvenile, uh, means it's not, it's probably about a, a year old, a year and a half old. This is a, a taper skull and you can see all the teeth in it here. So upper, upper part of the skull is upside down. And so here's the front teeth in here. And then uh, this is a different animal. This is a, what's called, this is a, a camel-like animal, it's, uh, sort of like a llama. And uh, this is a lower jaw. You can see all the teeth are in really good, good condition. And, uh, and then here's, here's a special one. This is a, uh, it's almost a complete skeleton. Uh, let's see if I can get a good, here we go. That's not bad. Uh, I can see the hip bones here and the tail here and all the, all the shoulder elements up here, the spine. This is a gopher and it's probably in its hole and uh, probably was trapped in there and then uh, was protected and uh, until we found it. Now we do have very small things as well. There's a couple of vials in here. Uh, now we can go all the way down to uh, uh, one cell animals. For the most part, what we, we can look for are, are most of these larger animals, but we also have a lot of things in the size range of, of mice and, and small lizards. And so um, this vial has, I don't think you can actually see it in here, but there's a, a partial jaw of a, I think it's a lizard in here. Uh, oh, that's a, it's a, actually it's a cotton rat. So it's a small rodent, a lower jaw with a tooth in it. And then, uh, uh, let's see. We'll see this in a minute. I already showed you a picture of this. This is the actual fossil of the um, uh, beak of that terror bird. So the whole skull would be about this big. And uh, that's the, the fossil itself. So that's a good one. And uh, I think we got one time for one more round of Look at some actual uh, tech. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Look at the fossil skull. I'm going to talk here about both photogrammetry and drones and, and our highest tech that we, we do. And this is uh, done all by our volunteers. So they've learned most of this stuff on their own. Uh, how to, uh, photogrammetry, for those of you who don't know, is, is uh, making, uh, taking uh, photographs and, and making 3D images out of them. And from the 3D images, you can actually make uh, um, three-dimensional uh, print in, in, a, in either plastic or some other, other medium. And uh, so examples of that are, uh, I think one of the things we've had before, this is a, yeah, I don't know if you can see this. This is a skull of a, about a three million year old lizard, uh, uh, similar to a, to uh, an iguana. Um, and so the question is always, is that real size or is this real size? And here's the, these are both printed uh, with 3D printing through photogrammetry. And this, oh, that's why we like to use these things because you can drop them and they don't, uh, they don't usually break. But this is um, uh, the same exact skull. Uh, it's, we use the same set of data uh, points that are captured when we do a scan of, or photographic coverage of the of the object and then you can print it out at any scale. So this is actually the size of the, of the oh boy, <laughs> just all oh, butterfingers today, but it's uh, actually the, the size of the, of the actual um, fossil 
And by blowing it up like this, you can handle it and not drop it. And uh, uh, especially with uh, children or, 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 or students, um, you can see the, the features that are being discussed and, and studied uh, much easier than you can uh, with the actual size in some cases. So other examples are, uh, here's our, our friend, the, um, this is back to our friend, the uh, uh, terror bird. And here's, I think this is closer to the actual size of the, of the fossil. And this is one of the first ones that was made from it, from the data set. And then it was uh, hand colored. And then here again, showing we can, we can uh, raise these to the side. And here's an example, this is not our fossil. This is an example of, of the skull of this bird uh, from Florida. And so we were able to get a copy of this, a plastic copy. And, uh, but we can see by holding our, our fossil here, uh, you can show exactly which part of the, of the critter we're looking at. And then the other aspect to these is that we can, we don't have to just do objects. We can also do, uh, go out in the field and we can uh, do an area of land. And so in the case of the, I don't know if you remember the footprint we were looking at earlier, the, let's see, how was it? I hope we saw it like that. Uh, it's the Gompathir footprint, and you can see the Gompathir here, and then the, the wolf up here, and the kitty cats over oh, there. You go, yeah, Gompathir, wolf, kitty cat. Um, well, guess what? This is, I think, something like 112 or, or small the size, and this is printed out full size from the same data set. Uh, as you can see, it had to be pieced together in four pieces based on the size of the printer, maximum, maximum printing size. And uh, so we have this really nice uh, full-size print of this. Remember, there's a proboscidean, uh, so it's like an elephant, but a little bit small. And uh, do we have any, uh, uh, oh, what else are we going to, oh, and drones, we're also doing uh, drone technology. And uh, with drones, we can actually do the 3D. Uh, photogrammetry as well. So uh, we're trying to keep up with the times. And um, I, I hope uh, this has helped under, help you understand what we're doing here at Ansborego. And uh, uh, thank you for, for watching.